In the past, we've talked a lot about carbon, and specifically one of its naturally occurring forms, graphite. Natural graphite on its own has a variety of interesting properties from being highly conductive of both heat and electricity, to acting as a lubricant, to being fairly chemically resistant. Graphite is what's considered a bulk material because on an atomic scale, graphite is actually millions of single atom thick sheets of carbon, all stacked together. Because of the stacked nature of graphite, it opens up an interesting approach for how we can modify its material properties. Instead of trying to modify the individual layers, which are very chemically stable, instead we can put things between the layers to modify graphite's properties. This process is called intercalation, and we looked at one instance of it in the last graphene video. We used electrolysis to force the ions between the layers, but since we were only interested in the graphene, those ions were only used to force the layers apart. If we were to instead use a more gentle process, it's possible to keep the layers together and put a variety of atoms and molecules in the space in between. Depending on what you choose as your intercalating material, the new compound will have a range of properties. For example, if you were to intercalate with potassium atoms, the color of the graphite changes to a bronze color, and this new compound is one of the most powerful reducing agents that we know of. It's also superconductive at very low temperatures, but it's also pyrophoric and will burst into flames on contact with oxygen, so it's kind of a mixed bag. Using intercalation, it's even possible to make graphite semiconductive this way. If we intercalate with metal halide, we can get p-type materials, or if we use alkali metals, we can get n-type materials. We can also make new and weird states of matter using this process, like spin glasses, which when you briefly apply a magnetic field to them, they become magnetic and then slowly fade to non-magnetic, unlike paramagnetic materials which instantly lose their magnetism, or ferromagnetic materials which maintain their magnetism permanently. There are many different approaches to intercalating graphite, and the method greatly depends on what you're trying to intercalate. For things like alkali metals or halides, it's usually sufficient to apply the elemental material to graphite. For things like potassium, this means melting potassium in a container with graphite. Or for bromine, this means exposing graphite to gaseous bromine. For non-elements, things like metal halides, sulfites, perchlorates, and more, the process is usually a bit more involved. In this video, we'll be looking at one of the last cases, though we'll explore others in the future. Specifically, we'll be intercalating sulfuric acid. To do this requires only a few things. 96-98% to sulfuric acid, concentrated nitric acid, a lot of deionized water, and of course, our graphite. Your source of graphite is important, as there's sort of a minimum size that this will work. If the individual graphite pieces are too small, the stuff we intercalate will essentially fall right out when we go to wash the end product. So err on the side of larger. If your pieces are too large, you can always just mill them smaller once this is done. Before we begin, a word of warning. This procedure deals with very strong acids, produces a lot of heat, and fumes wildly. This must be done outside or in a fume hood, and fire safety protocols must be in place. Wear gloves and a face mask at all times. The procedure itself is extremely simple. First, we prepare a mixture of acids in a ratio of 9 to 1 sulfuric to nitric. Then we mix in some graphite. Here I'm using about 25 grams, and the mixture instantly becomes a thick acidic mud. Let this sit overnight so the acids have time to work. And with that, most of the chemistry is done. See? Simple, right? Now all that's left is the job of cleaning off all the excess acid. The best way to do this is to first transfer the mixture to a container that's significantly larger. Here I'm using a 1 liter beaker, but something 2 to 3 times this size would be preferred. Then dilute it with a massive amount of deionized water. Generally, it's bad to add water to acids like this, but if the added water volume is large and the addition is fairly quick, it keeps potential heating and sudden boiling to a minimum. After the first addition of water, I filtered everything using a Buchner funnel and regular coffee filter. Using some litmus paper, check the filtrate and continue washing until it's no longer acidic. Once the litmus paper comes out neutral, this can be left to dry. So, what can you do with this? In the graphene video, I mentioned that if you apply energy to an intercalated graphite, the ions force the layers apart. Well, let's see what happens when we apply that idea to this material. I've put a very small amount of the material in a beaker, and I put that into the microwave for a few seconds. As soon as the microwave starts, the graphite instantly starts sparking wildly. It's hard to see, but as the layers are ripped apart, the sulfuric acid is escaping and pieces of graphene are being flung all over the beaker. Because the sulfuric acid is being released, this produces a lot of fumes, so it's best to do this in a fume hood or outside. When the treatment is done, you can see that the amount of material seems to have increased significantly. This is now what's called expanded graphite, and is a very important industrial starting material. 
because all the layers are puffed up but are still actually slightly attached, by putting this stuff into industrial roller they can squish all the layers back together, but now they'll be woven together like the pages of two books. This allows you to make large, flexible sheets of graphite which we call graphite foil. Alternatively, we can sonicate this briefly to make graphene, though I find that graphene produced this way is oddly insoluble in the usual solvents. Fortunately, while this particular intercalated compound is easy to produce, its uses are kinda limited. But it serves as a really good introduction to the concept. So in future videos, we'll be revisiting this to see how we can make some of the more interesting compounds, starting with iron chloride intercalated graphite, which is both a spin glass and is more conductive than regular graphite. So be sure to check back every other Monday for all of that. Before we get to the wrap up, some exciting news. I've started making a line of posters and merch and I'm excited to announce the first item that's ready for sale. In the last video, we explored how we can measure Planck's constant and since it's such a great demonstration of optics and quantum mechanics, I thought it deserved its own poster. I'll be making more of these in the future as well as t-shirts and other items. So if you're interested, check the link in the description for more info. If there's a particular design that you'd like to see, or a particular kind of merch that you're interested in, be sure to leave them in the comments and I'll be sure to see what I can do. Also, I've recently changed the rewards on my Patreon and now some of the levels include free merch, so be sure to check that out if you're interested or just want to support the show. Also, I'll be starting the bi-monthly Q&A videos in two weeks, so if you've got a question you've always wanted answered, be sure to check out the Kill Electron Volt tier to get in on that. Finally, I just wanted to share some of the images that people have sent in for the Citizen Google Earth project. These are all gorgeous, and thanks to everyone who sent them in. And with that, it's finally time to wrap up this video. As always, if you've enjoyed, be sure to subscribe for more videos and leave a rating. It really helps out the show. If you've got ideas for other materials you'd like me to try and make, be sure to leave me a comment, as I always love reading your suggestions. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.